Notice that Daniel's choice began with inward conviction. It says he purposed in his heart. That is, he made a choice deep inside. After soul searching, he came up with his choice. But this is really good news. All the indoctrination, all the intimidation, all the isolation, all the redesignation is met by Daniel's determination. You have a young teenage boy who's been abducted saying at this point, nope, not going to cross that line. So he's determined. He purposes in his heart. Listen, the power to not conform to the culture around you is always an inside job. It always begins on the inside. And it happens when your decisions become your convictions. Anybody can make a decision, a choice. But when those decisions and choices become your defined nature, your conviction, this is who I am, it's different. Now listen, the effectiveness of the rest of Daniel's life depends on this very moment. If he doesn't make the right choice, Daniel would not make the right impact. This choice that he makes that day will determine the man that he will become every day after this day. He's making a very, very important choice. I I want you to see what W.A. Criswell, he's been in heaven a while, but look at what he said about this. He said, all of life is filled with crises and decisions. There are right decisions, wrong decisions, high roads, low roads, and almost every day there will be a fork in the road where you are today is due to the turn in the road you took yesterday. You are the product of your choices. You are where you are because of the choices you have made. And you have many more to make. So your decisions must become your convictions. Purpose of heart. Purpose of heart. So it began with an inward conviction. But notice something else. It included a spiritual definition. Notice that Daniel doesn't see the delicacies offered him as delicacies. Daniel sees the delicacies offered him as defilement. He didn't go, hot dog. I'm a teenager and I get all the wine I can drink and all the desserts I can have. He didn't see it that way. Look at verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I know, you're still thinking, what's the big deal? Food is food. Not to Daniel, he's a Jewish kid. And according to his law, Jewish law, there are certain kinds of food you can eat and certain kind you can't eat. And when you can eat it, it's called kosher cuisine. And when you can eat it, it's unkosher. And it's a practice still to this day. So according to Levitical laws, you certainly couldn't eat stuff that has been sacrificed to pagan gods. And the way the Babylonians prepared it evidently was not according to Jewish kosher law. So he just says, not going to do it. And then he said, I don't want the wine, because the wine had been poured onto pagan altars, that was their practice, and then the rest of the wine was taken undiluted, and the Jews didn't drink undiluted wine. They would mix their wine, 20 parts of water to one part of wine, because wine was basically used by the Jews to kill germs. So the idea of something that was offered to a foreign god that might give me an altered state of consciousness as well as this pagan revelry, no, I'm not going to do it. So he called it a defilement. And, And I know you might think, yeah, I still don't see what the big deal is. I mean, Daniel is not in Jerusalem, he's in Babylon. So Dude, accommodate, right? I mean, when in Babylon, live like the Babylonians. Your, your parents aren't even around. Your friends are even, are even around. The, the rabbis aren't here. Nobody's going to see. Do what you want. You got a lot of excuses. That's, that's the deal. Daniel wasn't looking for an excuse because Daniel was living with purpose. And when you live with purpose, you don't look for an excuse. The only reason you look for an excuse is if you don't have a purpose to live for. So he, he had a purpose, he had a name, he had a goal. He's saying basically to the king and to the king's 
head of the eunuchs, look, you, you can isolate me and you can re-educate me and you can intimidate me and you can redesignate me, but you can't change me. This is who I am at the core. No matter what happens, this is who I am. I'm not afraid of that. Which brings up a topic. What is it that defiles you? There's all sorts of things that taint us, that pollute us, that corrupt us, that can contaminate us. They could be movies or TV shows that you now feel the freedom to binge on, websites you go to, places you frequent, relationships you're involved in. What I am suggesting from the scriptures is that you develop the conviction to say no so that you will have the occasion to say yes. Develop the conviction to say no so that you will have the occasion to say yes. When you close the door to defilement, you open the door to development. God will do some great thing. You say no to certain things, new opportunities. The Lord will spring into your path. Now, it all begins in the heart. It all begins deep inside. It begins with a belief system, a mindset, that no matter where I am at, whether I'm in Jerusalem or Babylon, whether I'm in church or in Starbucks, no matter where I might be, God is always there. The camera is always on. The microphone is always on. It says in Proverbs 5, the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he ponders all of his paths. Remember the story of Moses before he became Moses the leader and he was disgruntled because he knew that the Egyptians were oppressing the Israelites. And he looked one day and he saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite. And Moses went over and killed him. But this is what the Bible says. Moses looked this way, and Moses looked that way, and then Moses killed him. You know what his problem was? He didn't look that way. And if you live that way, I'm looking this way and that way, so are people looking? God is always looking. And Daniel knew that. Even as a young teenager, he's in Babylon going, God's here. God's here. So that was his protest. That's the predicament. That's the protest. But I want to show you something else. I want to show you the petition. Go, go back to verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested, notice that word, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king. I'm afraid of Nebuchadnezzar who has appointed your food and drink. This is his menu, not mine. Why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. Look at, look at our king isn't a nice guy. He cuts heads off. Mine's next. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. And let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. So it's a vegan diet. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. As you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them for ten days. Now watch this. Daniel isn't just reactive. Daniel is proactive. He's, he's not just resisting an order. He is requesting an alternative. So please note, first of all, in verse 8, it says, Daniel requested. It doesn't say, Daniel demanded. Or Daniel picketed. Or Daniel yelled and protested and screamed and defamed. He requested. That's showing honor. Look at verse 12. What's the first word? What does Daniel say? Please. His mama taught him right. 
He uses please and thank you. Please test your servants for 10 days. See, Daniel is not some holier-than-thou kid saying, look here, you filthy pagans. He's respectful. He's nice. He is honoring. And God brought him into the respect and honor of the servant, head of the eunuchs. Did you know in Proverbs 16 it reads, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him? That's what you have happening here. Yeah, be a nonconformist, by all means. But be a nice one. You don't have to be a mean one. You can be a nice one. Don't try to pick a fight. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, it says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance. You know, some people, some Christian people, some preachers, always seem mad. Um, Mad at those that disagree with him or her, uh, rebuking political leaders, ranting about what is really a personal opinion. Ben Franklin was right. He said, you'll catch more flies with honey than you will with vinegar. 